10 UVM meeting. So I'm going to just give you a brief update this morning on the current situation with two of the most recently emerging arboviruses, uh, very similar in many ways to dengue that we just heard about and yellow fever before that. These are Zika and chikungunya virus. So just to remind you that these are uh, like yellow fever and, and dengue, they're zoonotic viruses. They're among three of these four that we believe evolved in sylvatic cycles involving non-human primates in Africa. In the case of chikungunya spread uh, over hundreds of years on sailing ships around the world. Uh, and in the case of Zika, at least over decades spread out of Africa into Asia. And then we all know the recent history of, of spread into the Americas for both of these viruses. So there are two mosquito vectors I'm going to be referring to that are involved in the urban transmission cycle, not in the sylvatic cycle. And uh, this is Aedes aegypti, which originally was an African mosquito that became uh, domesticated on multiple occasions before it spread around the world on sailing ships centuries ago. And then uh, Aedes albopictus, which is generally considered a secondary vector for all four of these viruses, um, not really at all for yellow fever virus, uh, any evidence of transmission. But this is a mosquito that only recently spread from its origins in Asia to many parts of Africa, South and North America, and even into Southern Europe since the mid-1980s. Uh, so just to begin with a very brief introduction to chikungunya virus, um, it's different in some ways and similar in other ways to the three other Aedes aegypti-borne viruses. The main difference is that although it's rarely fatal, it has very high attack rates and very high rates of symptomatic infection. So unlike dengue, and we also heard yellow fever, where most infections are either asymptomatic or mild febrile illness. Uh, the majority of people infected by chik chikungunya uh, get uh, very severe arthralgia that can persist for months or even years. Uh, when it does cause fatal or severe infections, these are mainly in the elderly or during peripartum transmission where the fetus can be infected during uh, childbirth from a viremic mother and there can be either a fatal outcome or a very severe neurologic sequelae. And then uh, uh, like uh, dengue certainly, and uh, less so the other two viruses, the disability resulting from these chikungunya infections involving millions of people the past decade can be really major due to the massive disability and economic impacts. So the current situation with chikungunya is shown on this map. Um, Chikungunya has a number of different genotypes or lineages that were, uh, most of these were actually first defined by Ann Powers who did the first sequencing and phylogenetic studies when she was a postdoc in Galveston a few years back. And, uh, and one of these lineages, the Indian Ocean lineage, which emerged from Africa in 2004 was identified more recently. But uh, basically in Africa, we have two enzootic lineages throughout sub-Saharan Africa that sometimes emerge and spread uh, historically often to Asia, uh, predating 1958 and then again in 2005 and 6, spreading into this region. Uh, these same African lineages of often are transported directly to France, probably because of the strong relationship between former French colonies and and uh, French uh, 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 commerce. And so uh, outbreaks uh, for the past 10 years, small outbreaks in southern France have often involved direct introductions from Africa or other uh, European outbreaks, including just this past year in Italy, before that in 2007, have come from these major urban outbreaks, in, especially in India, spreading via air travelers into Europe. And then in the Americas, in, at least in recent times, uh, one lineage, the Asian lineage that had been in Southeast Asia since the 1950s, spread into the Caribbean in 2013. And then only one year later, another strain, an African strain, spread directly from Angola into Northeastern Brazil. So in the Americas, we also have two different lineages of chikungunya virus circulating now. So the uh, epidemic in the Americas, according to the graphs you can find on the internet, basically ended 
uh, in 2017 with uh, uh, transmission beginning in the fall in the Caribbean then spreading into other Caribbean areas, Central America, eventually into South America. Although I think if you talk to our Brazilian colleagues here, they'll tell you there's still quite a bit of chikungunya, especially in southern Brazil. But like uh, all of these diseases, after the publicity of the outbreak has waned, uh, diagnostics wanes, surveillance wanes, and all of these infections fall back under the dengue umbrella. And we don't know whether they're really dengue, Zika, chikungunya, or sometimes in South America, yellow fever. So chikungunya is still causing quite a bit of disease in the southern cone of South America, but there have also been renewed outbreaks. This one last year I mentioned in two different regions of Italy, probably imported from either Pakistan or India. Uh, France having small outbreaks uh, as well in the Marseille area. And then major outbreaks in India and Pakistan only about 10 years after the first wave came out of Africa in 2005 and 2006 involving tens of thousands of cases. So chikungunya certainly, although it's receiving less attention, is still doing a lot of damage in many parts of the world. We, we learned uh, back about 10 years ago that chikungunya has the ability, although it's normally transmitted by Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, which are probably overall a better vector because they live in more close association with people than Aedes albopictus. But some mutations uh, in the envelope proteins E1 and E2 can have a dramatic impact on increasing the ability of one particular lineage, the Indian Ocean lineage, to infect Aedes albopictus. And what's very surprising about these mutations is that although they have a dramatic impact in this species when they occur in this lineage, they have little or no impact in Aedes aegypti and they have little or no impact when they uh, occur, that is when they're placed into cDNA clones into, for example, the Asian lineage that occurs now in the Americas. Uh, they have no impact uh, because of epistatic mutations. And these uh, epistatic mutations now number two different ones. Uh, one of them that occurred when the virus was introduced into Asia somewhere before 1958 involved an alanine to threonine at position 98 of E1. Uh, if a virus arrives uh, like uh, the Asian lineage did, probably a single point source int introduction from an infected person, and, and it has a threonine which has remained in Asia ever since, this threonine blocks the, uh, the, the impact or the phenotype of this mutation almost completely. A second mutation that's more or less a polymorphism in different strains in Africa, the East Central South African lineage. Uh, one of these two amino acids allows this mutation to exert its effect like the Indian Ocean lineage happened to pick up when it left Africa and others without this like the Brazilian strain that occurred that uh, was introduced in 2004 have the wrong amino acid and therefore we predicted that they would not have the same ability to adapt uh, to Aedes albopictus. So both of these are strains in the Americas now that we predicted would not do well in Aedes albopictus, either this founder effect or this polymorphism. And so far, all of the more than 200 sequences from either of these lineages in the Americas, not a single one has yet shown this valine at position 226, at least initially supporting the hypothesis. And we're now putting these mutations into strains from the Caribbean and from Brazil to test this experimentally. But it's good, good luck, at, at least, if you want to look at the glass being very slightly full, that if, if we were going to pick a couple of strains to arrive in the Americas, it could have been worse than these two strains with the ability of Aedes albopictus to transmit the virus in, in uh, more temperate climates. But these epistatic uh, interactions um, really were completely unpredictable before we started doing reverse genetic studies on chikungunya. Another very surprising finding uh, from a few years back now was that the three prime untranslated region of chikungunya virus also has a dramatic impact on its evolution and ability to cause outbreaks. When, when Anne started sequencing chikungunya strains and, and since that time many more have been done, it was noted that there's a great deal of variation in the length of the three prime untranslated region. Uh, 
with the Asian lineage having a much longer UTR than the African lineages. And so we wanted to try to reconstruct the history of this and understand what the variation in these lengths. And to make a very long story uh, short, it turns out that when that virus arrived from Africa into Asia sometime before the, the late 1950s, even though it now has a very long UTR, we believe it arrived with a shortened UTR due to a deletion in the, the original sequence. And ever since that time, it's been basically trying to regain fitness in various ways, including by duplicating some of these uh, genetic regions in the UTR uh, and then adding a lot of point mutations in other areas. But even today, if you take the UTR from any Asian lineage virus, including those that are now in the Americas, and you substitute that virus strain with the UTR from an African strain, it becomes more fit. So the, the, the fitness has not been able to regain the original African phenotype despite circulating for over 60 years in Asia. So these founder effects, and we believe that this, this deletion was a founder effect like the threonine 98, can have a very major impact on the future of epidemic potential for a virus like chikungunya. And we believe this happens frequently because when people serve as the point source for a new outbreak, uh, they, they would arrive by Remy in a location where Aedes aegypti is present. And when Aedes aegypti feeds on people, unless they're at the very peak of viremia, only a few uh, cells in their midgut may become infected. A severe bottleneck may occur. And then we know that typically when that mosquito or any mosquito transmits chikungunya virus, its saliva contains typically about 10 infectious virus particles. So another bottleneck occurs at transmission. And so a point source introduction accompanied by these bottlenecks can really uh, fix a, a mutation that may have no advantage at all in the case of the 98 threonine or actually be deleterious in the case of this uh, purported deletion and fix uh, into the genome uh, deleterious genetic elements that may take decades to recover or may prevent the virus from spreading at all in, case, in which case we probably never see it. Now moving on to Zika, of course, uh, the Zika story in, uh, has uh, similar origins in Africa, spread into Asia many decades ago, but typically is a very mild disease, so it was virtually unnoticed for many decades until about 10 years ago when outbreaks were reported in Yap Island and Gabon in France. And then, of course, the first big story came when an outbreak spread into French Polynesia and a two to tenfold increase in the incidence of Guillain-Barre syndrome was noticed coincident with Zika virus infection. And then it spread uh, probably in early 2013, although it wasn't detected until 2015 in northeastern Brazil. And then a major epidemic in this completely naive population infected millions of people and suddenly a rise in the rate of microcephaly was noticed when the thousands of pregnant women became infected and thousands of children developed this, uh, this disease or a small uh, head size either measured before or after childbirth. And a, a wide range of congenital defects have been discovered since and this whole syndrome is now referred to as congenital Zika syndrome. So like uh, chikungunya, the Zika outbreak looks like it's over in the Americas if you just look at the uh, graphs on the PAHO website, you can see that since 2017 there's been very little activity following the peak, which for Zika was uh, a little bit later and in a different part of the Americas, mainly in, in Brazil and the southern cone uh, earlier on than chikungunya. But uh, again, this is deceiving because probably now only some pregnant women, not even all pregnant women, can be tested for Zika virus infection. The serologic tests are very cross-reactive, so it can't be distinguished from dengue uh, or, or other flaviviruses unless the patient comes during the period of, of viremia. And for a mild, typically mild disease, that doesn't occur very often. So there's probably a lot more Zika still circulating and infecting people than is reflected in this graph here, particularly in the southern cone. Uh, and Zika, um, uh, although there were small outbreaks detected over the past few years in Southeast Asia, uh, 
And although there was evidence that the virus had been present in the past in the Indian subcontinent, for the past two years only has there been evidence of, of transmission and disease in Africa. You may have seen some things on the news the past few weeks. There were small outbreaks last year, bigger outbreaks uh, near Delhi in several regions of India this year involving uh, over 100 uh, confirmed diagnoses. Uh, what's been a little bit um, uh, disconcerting is that some officials from the Indian government have pointed to sequences for these virus strains which are not yet on GenBank, not having certain mutations that have been published in the literature as possibly related to the ability of the virus to cause congenital disease. And these officials are saying basically don't worry, the strains we have in India will not cause microcephaly. And I think we're extremely uh, far away from being able to make any conclusion about any Zika strain about the, the, the probability of, of microcephaly occurring, and I'll show you some of the reasons why. So there were two major hypotheses about why the sudden appearance of these adverse uh, outcomes with Zika infection and why the, the outbreaks began at all. One is that there was adaptive evolution, like I've shown you for transmission by Aedes albopictus of chikungunya virus, or this could have enhanced human viremia as well, which could en enhance the uh, efficiency of transmission, or the virus could have simply become more uh, uh, virulent for reasons not related to transmission, uh, possibly related to enhancement by dengue immunity, as you just heard, can s severely impact the outcome of disease and dengue is a close relative of Zika. The other hypothesis is that this is just all stochastic. The virus reached the right place at the right time, uh, South uh, Pacific, where people travel very frequently by, by air. The majority of people in, in uh, French Polynesia became infected, and it was just a matter of time. So looking at the, uh, the evolution of Zika virus, uh, o over the time since it left Africa and moved into Asia, you can see that there are a number of amino acid substitutions that occurred during this time. One of them, NS1188, um, shown here and here, uh, was described last year as enhancing slightly the ability of the virus to infect Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. Notice that this and, and three of these other mutations occurred twice, where uh, one time uh, the amino acid residue changed either during the period of introduction into Asia or the early spread through Asia, but then it either directly reverted or in some cases two different mutations occurred. But four of these involved uh, uh, direct reversions of mutations that occurred earlier when the virus spread out to Asia. And this is highly suggestive of, of what I was just mentioning for chikungunya. What, when these viruses are introduced to a new location, a point source, typically a viremic human, there's a very severe bottleneck, and uh, random mutations can be taken by that person or by the mosquito infected from that person and can initiate spread in, in the new region, and they can be deleterious or at least not advantageous in some cases. So this suggested that perhaps there were a number of founder effects when Zika virus reached Asia, and then some of these reverted either just before or during the spread into the South Pacific and the Americas. So to test these four mutations and the other ones, we've, we've simplified the assays to what we call a competition fitness assay that makes it much uh, less labor intensive to test many of the mutations like I showed you and to control the uh, experiments uh, better because we do them in the same mosquito under the same conditions. So we take a wild type virus, and I'm going to show you experiments done with a Cambodian strain that's a close relative of the ancestor of all the American strains, and we engineer it for, with a single point mutation. We mix that mutant with the wild type, put it in uh, either, uh, uh, first of all, we, we estimate this ratio by doing RT-PCR around the mutation, and then we do pyrosequencing to determine the ratio of the mutant versus the wild type. And then we put that same uh, aliquot either into an artificial blood meal for infecting mosquitoes or into various animal models, mainly mice, but we had one opportunity to do this with non-human primates. And we simply look at, at the outcome of these mosquito and vertebrate infections 
by PCRing either the head of the mosquito or the blood of the animal and looking for a change in that ratio from what we started with to what we finished with here and see which, which uh, mutant or wild type is winning the competition. And these are just some of the initial uh, results from testing Aedes aegypti from Galveston. First of all, the 188 mutation shown by the Chinese group to enhance infectivity. You can see when we start with about a roughly one-to-one -one ratio, almost always the uh, valine mutant here wins the competition in six of seven mosquitoes. Uh, this is an example of uh, a pre-M mutation at position one, where if we start with a little bit more of the mutant, the, the wild type seems to have a slight advantage in winning the competition. So this, this mutation may actually have a slightly deleterious impact. And this is not one of the ones that reverted in the phylogenetic tree. Here's another one that didn't revert, but seems to have a fairly strong advantage in most mosquito infections. And here again are three others uh, that did revert in that tree that seem to have strong advantages. And another one where the outcome seems to be more or less random, so no particular advantage or disadvantage of this mutation uh, at position 114. Uh, so the bottom line is that most of these, at least in our initial pilot studies, mutations that uh, we saw coming out of Africa change to one residue and then reverting to another more recently, uh, seem to be recovery of fitness recently before the virus spread into the Americas, suggesting that the virus did adapt through uh, several mutations with small phenotypes to be able to be transmitted more efficiently by Aedes aegypti. But these are relatively small impacts. In fact, if we compare three different genotypes of chikungunya virus, an African strain here, uh, the FSS, this is the Cambodian strain we use for these competitions, and then a Mexican strain from the American outbreak. And we look at infection of the bodies, uh, dissemination uh, from the body to the legs, and then infection of the saliva following three different doses, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5, and 10 to the 6 in artificial blood meals. Uh, you don't have to look hard to notice the dramatic difference between the African strain and the Asian and American strains. The African strain actually infects much more efficiently than either of these strains, which don't show a major difference in infectivity for Aedes aegypti. So uh, the, the, the real conundrum here is uh, if this uh, African strain, uh, like others, is so much more efficient at using Aedes aegypti as a vector, why haven't we seen strains moving directly out of Africa to initiate outbreaks like we've seen with chikungunya in southern France. And could, th could this happen? And these, these African strains are also more virulent in mouse models for, for Zika, including congenital defects. So is it possible that African strains could cause an outbreak with even higher rates of congenital syndrome than the strains that happened to arrive from Asia a few years ago? And this is going to require, of course, a lot more very detailed genetic work because these strains differ by about 15% in their nucleotide sequences from all of these. Finally, I just want to mention um, this hypothesis about dengue immunity enhancing Zika infection. There was some experimental work done in vitro and in and mice that showed you could take dengue antisera, transfer it passively or use it in cell culture, and enhance Zika virus replication. And this suggested that Immunity, which is very high for dengue in South America, as we just heard, in the Caribbean and Central America, could have allowed Zika to enhance viremia, perhaps uh, increase its chance of transplacental infection of the fetus. Now, fortunately, there's evidence coming at, out now from epidemiologic studies, including some done by uh, Mauricio Nogueira's group and, and others who are following cohorts of patients who are infected by dengue and Zika. These are some data from a project in Salvador that I've been working with the Fiocruz Institute on where they've been monitoring dengue, shown here in the red peaks for many years in a prospective cohort in Salvador. And then when Zika arrived, and Zika is shown by this small uh, yellow <coughs> spikes here either in the cohort data or the citywide data here, you'll notice that uh, the year following the Zika outbreak, there are no red peaks any longer. Dengue has nearly disappeared from Salvador, uh, 
after the appearance of Zika. Now this could be explained by better mosquito control, better education of people to protect themselves from bites, but you'll notice that chikungunya virus, uh, shown here in blue, the year after Zika has a huge peak, a huge epidemic occurred in Salvador. Same uh, vector, same transmission pattern, so none of those things can explain why dengue disappeared but not chikungunya. And I think the best explanation is that Zika immunity here, at least for a short time period, is cross-protecting against dengue. And some of these other studies have shown a reduction in Zika uh, symptomatic disease in, in people recently infected by dengue. So I think there's some degree of cross-protection in both directions. So just to conclude, uh, chikungunya and Zika probably now are permanently endemic. Uh, uh, they both arrive from Africa, but I expect they'll both be around for a very long time in Asia, in the Americas, probably transiently in, in Europe, depending on climate change, maybe more frequent in the future. Uh, the peak of the epidemics in, in the Americas have certainly passed, but there's quite a bit of transmission still going on. It's simply not being uh, uh, tested and not reported, and we're seeing new outbreaks in Africa, Asia, uh, and Europe. Uh, but I really want to highlight that these founder effects and these epistatic interactions that I mentioned are, are really having a major impact, I think, on the emergence of some of these vector-borne diseases. And we really cannot predict these, these things a priori. It's only after we see the mutations that have occurred phylogenetically and we start putting them into cDNA clones that we can understand the dramatic impacts and the stochastic nature of, of these impacts on outbreaks. And I think this, this really is a, an indication that we can only go so far in predicting what's going to happen in the future with these kind of viruses. And finally, these post-emergence uh, mutations both in chikungunya, uh, multiple mutations, and now it's starting to look like multiple mutations in Zika as well, although they have smaller phenotypes, are probably contributing to transmission either by Aedes albopictus or Aedes aegypti, depending on wh which virus we're looking at. Finally, I just want to mention uh, my lab group who's been doing the uh, evolutionary work on both viruses, the mosquito vector competence work. Uh, we work very closely with Peiyong Shi, who does a lot of the reverse genetics of Zika with us, as well as vaccine development for Zika. And then the group uh, in Senegal that really laid the groundwork for understanding where these viruses come from and how they're maintained in Africa, uh, including the Institut Pasteur in Dakar, Senegal. I want to call them out as well. So thanks for your attention. <laughs>